Welcome again to this uh, this event this evening on yoga experience and the vagus nerve. And um, before we get started, I just want to mention, and maybe uh, Jared can throw a link in the chat. We do have another event coming up uh, this month, February 22nd, um, with Anna Case Winters, who teaches theology at McCormick uh, Presbyterian McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, which is a Presbyterian seminary where our our speaker this evening actually got her MDiv. Yes. And um, yes, Anna Case Winters is going to be speaking about her newest book called God Will Be All in All. And uh, we also have a couple of really cool events that we're planning right now for March and other things coming up. We're talking with actually with Leslie about coming back and doing a learning circle on the book Dune Messiah. So um, anyway, lots of lots of good things coming up. So obviously, uh, be sure to look for our emails and newsletters and things like that about that information. Uh, so let me just introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Leslie King is uh, serves First Presbyterian Church in Waco, Texas. And she's been there since 2012. And as I mentioned earlier, she got her MDiv from McCormick Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Chicago, and also then got a Doctor of Ministry at St. Paul School of Theology in Kansas City, Missouri, where she em did an emphasis on spirituality and organizational change. But she's um, been a yoga instructor since 2020 with Spirit Bear Yoga, and uh, other other places as well. She's worked at different studios in her area and loves uh, talking about yoga and teaching yoga. And um, I think that's probably good for us to talk. Well, she's she's married to DJ King and they have three young adult children. And I know that uh, you have at least three cats, I think you said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <ten cats. laughs> So anyway, we are fellow pet lovers. So with that, let's just go ahead and get started. And again, welcome to all of you. If you want to put where you're from in the chat, that'd be kind of fun. We could see that go by, but let's uh, not delay any longer hearing from Leslie. Go ahead. Sherry, thank you so much. I'm so happy to um, be here this evening and to be able to talk to you about the intersection of process thought and yoga and polyvagal theory. And so I'm very interested, uh, just a show of hands, just three brief questions. How many of you uh, feel like you are uh, knowledgeable on yoga? Just a show of hands. Okay, great. Um, this evening we'll be interspersing uh, practice with cognitive content. So uh, our first practice will be sort of a breathing exercise our second practice will be a stimulation of the vagus nerve. And our third practice will be a chair yoga practice. And um, so I invite you uh, for that end of class to consider being in a chair and to consider moving primarily your upper body, but there'll also be the opportunity to move your lower body in about a 15 minute practice um, as we draw together the content of uh, our pop-up this evening with an experience of, of the pop-up. And um, a second question is, how many of you feel pretty competent about vagus nerve and polyvagal theory? Um, can I just see zeros if you feel like this is a brand new thing for you? Okay, so a couple, yeah. So that's really great. Um, Sherry alluded to the chat earlier, and I really want to encourage that uh, if you know things that I'm leaving out, please put them in the chat. Uh, if I mention something that causes your brain to activate on another piece of information, please put that in the chat. That's just really enriching. And if you feel like I got something wrong, please put that in the chat. That's just really exciting. So we'll get um, all of that drawn together and make this really our own session. So right now I'm just sitting on the floor with my legs crossed. Uh, maybe you're sitting in a chair and maybe both of your feet are on the floor. Um, and maybe you've imagined yoga as fancy postures, inversions or arm balances or really bendy positions. 
But fundamentally, yoga is just one thing. It is breath. And so tonight, we're going to open with a little bit of breath work. And I just want to invite you to settle into whatever is kind of a neutral position for you. For me, that means shoulders over hips and ears over shoulders. And want to invite you to draw the shoulders up just a little bit and to roll them back and down. And we're going to draw an inhale for a count of three and I'll snap as we do it. Inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling. Exhaling. Really nice work. Your inhales provide energy and activation for your system. And your exhales calm your system to a more relaxed state. So we can use our inhales and our exhales strategically. And if you're anything like me in a very busy day, you can find that you have skipped some inhales and held your breath as you were doing your work. Um, and so really concentrating, allowing that breath to flow can be very powerful. Now I'm going to do something a little weird and you may want to follow me and you may not want to follow me because you've all been great and your screens are up and you may be too embarrassed to do this, but I'm not, I'm going to take my thumb and my ring, my ring, my, my fourth finger, which is my ring finger. And I'm going to do alternate nostril breathing. I'm going to place my thumb on my right nose, nostril. I'm going to inhale through my left nostril, hold it, close it off, open the right nostril, and exhale through. Inhale through the right, close it off, open the left, exhale through. The invitation is to just Play with this breathing. For just a few rounds of breath, they say that breathing through the right nostril invigorates and drawing air through the left nostril really calms us down. Whatever the situation, breathing through the nose is really powerful. As many of you know, there's a strong filtration system just in the back of our nose that strips out all the environmental co contaminants and sends really pure, clean air to our areoles in our lungs that really just have a small window of exchange. And so when you and I breathe through our nose versus breathing through our mouth, we're sending ready air for that quick exchange and we're really giving a nice gift to our lungs. Additionally, when we breathe through our nose, our tongue comes to the roof of our mouth and comes into contact with that vagus nerve, which is really a powerful thing to do. So I wanna invite you to close your mouth to draw an inhale, bringing that tongue to the roof of the mouth, and exhale it out through the nostrils. Breathing is the fundamental way that we engage our vagus nerve, which is truly, truly amazing. And I'm so happy to be able tonight to share these slides with you. Um, I believe they'll be made available. And um, I actually forgot to ask you that, Jared. Are they available later yeah, on? I can send it in a follow-up email. No problem. Okay. So tonight we're getting to know our vagus nerve, polyvagal theory, yoga, and process thought. So we've just done the practice work in which we've emphasized that exhales are calming to the system and inhales are energizing and the importance of nose breathing. And that's just our foundation. But uh, out, of, out of the brain uh, comes a 10th cranial nerve. 
And that is really highlighted right here, uh, coming out of both sides of the brain. And it is what is known as the vagus nerve, which is Latin for wandering, the wandering nerve. And you can see here how much it does wander. So this is the slide that shows the uh, lateral view of that wandering vagus nerve and also shows the anterior uh, view of that vagus nerve. Um, and we're going to get into the specific areas in just a bit. There are some important Whiteheadian principles that intersect with polyvagal theory. Uh, and I hope they'll become more obvious to you as we move through our discussion tonight. But one of the Whiteheadian principles is really the withness of the body and the way that the body informs our living. Um, the experience in our existence that goes all the way up and all the way down. And so we have perceptive tools um, in eyes, ears, nose, uh, those five senses. But we also have this very deeply seated neuroception. And that's at the heart of our conversation this evening. And the the third, uh, certainly not the only, but the third Whiteheadian principle that intersects with polyvagal theory is that none of us exist in isolation, but are deeply uh, interdependent in our relationships and mutually affect one another. So this is the gut feeling. I'm starting at the lowest portion. And this is a little hard to see, but it's the best I could do. Um, I wanted to get this present. I wanted to get my pointer as a laser. Um, this highlighted light yellow that's really covering the stomach and then coming all around the intestines uh, and colon area. Um, this is the vagus nerve literally wrapping itself around the gut. And it's a common parlance to talk about gut feelings, to talk about this sense that we have that something's right or something's wrong or something's wonderful. And um, this is a very intense area of the vagus nerve that uh, in terms of the autonomic nervous system is the oldest portion of the autonomic nervous system some 500 million years old, uh, reproduction, digestion, rest. This is the very base of what it means to be a human being and a mammal. Polyvagal theory really picks up at the break in evolution between reptiles and, and mammals. And so rising a little bit higher, we get into sort of the thoracic area of the of the vagus nerve. Um, and this really, this nerve at this point is very interested in respiration and heart rate. And so it wraps around these areas and uh, through the respiration and the heart rate is able to really communicate with the brain. Um, it's not uncommon, uh, you know, I'm kind of feeling repressed, my therapist tells me. Um, and he'll say to me, where are you feeling that feeling? And I'll say, I have no idea. But when he really works with me, I know that I'm feeling it very often across my chest. And so this neuroception that we have often comes to us through our heart rate, our respiration rate, through this region that is very, um, very uh, wandered through by that vagus nerve. This is a side view of that same thoracic area. It's a little tighter. And again, it's the bright yellow that's all around. And um, I just think it's fascinating how close it is to the spinal column and to the organ. I think that's a really beautiful picture. And so wanted wanted to be sure to share it with you. We're, we're coming up a little bit to the cervical area of the vagus nerve. Uh, here, things are a little bigger, and you can see that we're really at the neck and the clavicle area here, and it's going to end up being a nice, important area to be in touch uh, with the vagus nerve. 
uh, before it gets busy with all of those um, vital organs um, in our yoga practice. And so you've got a right and a left side of the vagus nerve. And part of what becomes really obvious in a yoga practice is that there's some real difference between the right and left sides of our body. We treat them differently and they react differently for us. Um, and uh, that that surely is part of our neuroception as well. This shows uh, the lateral view of that vagus nerve coming up. Um, it actually, of course, comes down from the brain, but uh, shows the way that this is set up. Uh, and look at where your ear is. So the ear is just a really proximate place uh, for vagal uh, nerve stimulation. Um, it's also a great indicator um, on relaxation and parasympathetic connection. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So just kind of moving through those slides pretty quickly, I do want to get back into a little bit of practice. And so um, the practice that I'd like to do is the gentle stimulation of the vagus nerve. And so to do that, I'm going to be using my head and I'm also going to be using my chest and my belly, which you can't see, but um, I'll be kind of coaching us through that. And so I want to invite you again, if you are seated, um, I'm going to just stop sharing my slide. If you're seated in a chair to be in a nice neutral position, and I want you to take a nice inhale in the neutral position. And an exhale is just to drop the right ear toward the right shoulder. That's an exhale. Inhale to draw it to neutral. And an exhale to drop left ear to left shoulder. And an inhale to bring it to neutral. Now we'll add on to that a little bit. An inhale. And I'm gonna bring my right hand to the left side of my head and I'm not going to apply a lot of pressure, just some gentle comfort. And I'm going to use my left hand to come alongside my neck and just palpate there along the side and up to the back of the ear. And I'm leaving some space between my right ear and my right shoulder. I'm really drawing that right shoulder down. Nice. Dropping that left hand releasing the right and bringing everything back to neutral on the inhale. Take an inhale, roll the shoulders back. Exhale to guide the head to the opposite side, drawing that hand to palpate with the fingers alongside where you imagine that vagus nerve to run up the back of the ears. And when you're satisfied with that, allowing that hand to rest, releasing the grip and bringing the head to neutral on an inhale. Inhale and exhale. Now, some people are so somatically in tune, that is they're so in tune with their body that this kind of touch really does feel like an activation. If you're more feeling repressed like me, you'll palpate that and you'll think, what the hell, that didn't really do anything. But it does bring a mindfulness to the location of the depth of your neuroception. And so the practice is really either for mindfulness or for physical stimulation, and either one can be really beneficial. We take that stimulation and we join it to a gentle tapping across the chest. And we maybe even drop that tapping down to where our heart is as we inhale and exhale. And then we just track that all the way down to the belly. We tap on the belly, maybe letting it kind of jiggle a little bit as we do that. And just really celebrating, you know, not, not judging the body when we touch it and coming back up and resting those hands. A big inhale and an exhale. The other option for the stimulation of the vagus nerve involves the eyes. And one of the things that our anatomical pictures did not show us is that 
after the gut, the most interested place, the vagus nerve, is across our face. And it absolutely wanders all under the stretches of our skull. It's especially interested around the eyes. This is a very intense place. It makes it possible for you and I. I mean, look at how generous you are with your screens on. This tells me so much more because I'm able to use my sense of sight to uh, feed my neuroception. And, and we're going to do a little exercise with the eyes from a sitting position. But before we do that, I want to demonstrate how it can happen in a reclined position, which I feel is more powerful. A reclined position would have us on our back. I would interlace my fingers together and I would rest my fingers at the base of my skull so that my skull was against the naughtiness of my fingers. And I would be able to rock my skull back and forth on those fingers. And my head pressure would be down on those fingers as I moved my eyes. So that's what you would do from a reclined position. From a sitting position, we are simply going to do the eye movement, which is holding the face forward, everything neutral, ears over shoulders. And we'll slide the eyes to the right, looking as if to the farthest corner of our eye, and then release to center. And then we'll look to the left, no movement of the neck or the head, and then release to center. The activation we're about to do will last one minute. And so I'm gonna time that on my watch and keeping the neutral alignment, we'll look to the right for one minute, welcoming any, go ahead and take that up, sliding the eyes, keeping them tight to the right field. Breathing as you hold the eyes in position. So there's a nice flow moving through the body. And noticing any popping in the ears, noticing any sighing. There can even be yawning. Breathing. Allowing the chest to fill with air on the inhale. Allowing the shoulders to roll back on the exhale. And gently on your next exhale, release those eyes to center. Roll the shoulders up, draw them back down. And the invitation now is to look to the left, sliding those eyes, face neutral. Drawing your breath and noticing that it's really challenging to find stillness even for one minute sometimes. Breathing. Holding. And on your exhale, move your eyes to neutral. Really nice work. Thanks for thanks for doing that with me. Um wanting to move forward in um after that little break of practice. That was the eye orientation exercise. And I do want to say, you can find a lot of this online. 
I think the other way that's common to invite you to activate the vagus nerve is to splash cold water on the face. And the question really is, if that feels good to you, you should definitely do it. And if it doesn't, um, that's maybe not a great way to activate your vagus nerve. Uh, I think sometimes we can activate to a state of, you know, kind of tenseness or mobility. So just figure that out for yourself. But there's a lot of nice suggestions online. So are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So we're going to shift now from talking about the vagus nerve to talking about polyvagal theory, which is really uh, Stephen Porges's theory of the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> And I've heard it said that, and I don't know if this is true, that Alfred North Whitehead said that if a dog jumps in your lap, it's because he's fond of you. But if a cat jumps in your lap, it's only because your lap is warmer. But I'm a cat lover and I like to think about my cats being fond of me. But the truth is um, that the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory runs true for, for mammals in general. Uh, and I think this is a really important uh, concept for uh, that intersects with process thought, that human beings are not privileged on this. Um, the cat and the dog that love you and I uh, in part love us because we co-regulate with them. And whether they are fond of us or we're just warm, either way, uh, that vagus nerve is being comforted and experiencing safety or uh, appropriate stimulation in our togetherness. I don't know why my slides are kind of slow to move. There we go. So the um, autonomic nervous system, uh, Stephen Porges would want to walk us gently into the fact that it's got two ends of a continuum, sympathetic and parasympathetic, uh, that sympathetic part of our autonomic nervous system helps us to mobilize for challenges or danger and to take appropriate action. And our parasympathetic really invites us to rest and digest, to relax and restore, um, and it can even move us to sort of a shutdown. This uh, vagus nerve is unique, and there's a lot going on in this slide, but basically what I want to focus on is the left-hand side of the slide, which the vagus nerve is really set apart because 90% of its nerve fibers are spent sending energy to the brain, um, and 10% of its nerve fibers are, sent, are, are spent receiving energy from the brain. So when we think about that, uh, that afferent function of the vagus nerve can be really mysterious. Um, we're not drawing information from the outside to get, we're having this sense come from within us. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important to attend to Porges's research uh, the science that he brings to that uh, declaration about the vagus nerve, I think that has strong impact for our sense of relationships, even our sense of spirituality. And this really comes down to neuroception then, this subconscious detection of our autonomic nervous system wherein we perceive danger or safety. <coughs> Excuse me. And this really comes back to our cats and our dogs, right? Um, a sense of danger, and they are mobilizing to the doors. Really, whether they are cats or dogs, they're doing that. If they have a sense of safety, they're really curled up. They're pretty relaxed. The cat might purr, and the dog might mutter like it's running and frolicking through a field somewhere. This neuroception gives us... Uh, this neuroception bases our perception of safety or danger and feeds the autonomic nervous system platform so that it's activated to provide an integrated effect for our physiology, our psychology, and our behavior, which is just really um, a pretty miraculous um, call to integrated living. Neuroception allows for quick 
and effective responses to inner and outer stimuli for relaxed and connected responses with safety and for mobilized responses when we experience danger. And so I just wanna share a brief story that has nothing to do with yoga necessarily, but does have to do with neuroception. And I, I work in the life of the church and I once had an organist who was very difficult. And somehow I decided that it was going to be okay for me to stop looking at my organist. Do you know what I mean? To stop making eye contact with that person. I thought that was a good idea. I think I thought that was a good idea at the time because I didn't feel safe with that organist. So I decided to break eye contact. And one day I was walking down a hallway and I noticed the organist in another room, but I didn't look. I just had a sense. And something rose up in me from my gut that said, you should look at him. But I did not look at him. And what followed that evening was a phone call from the organist to me that was very angry and intense. And, you know, it was very clear that neither one of us were feeling very safe. But it's an example in my memory of something coming deep within me related to my decisions about how I was going to manage my sense of safety or danger. And the way in which if something felt dangerous, I thought I could avoid it but my relationships were going to ask me to mobilize to it. And I think, um, I hope it makes some sense for me to share it with you. Um, but I think we have these moments in our lives where we um, think about how we're going to receive something. Maybe we're going to shut down away from it and it sort of comes after us anyway. And this is very related to, to polyvagal theory. Um, coming back to that neuroception slide and sharing it, um, I want to move on from there. So neuroception um, as the discernment is really this sense of interception, uh, these things that are coming up within us, maybe from our memory, maybe uh, from our experience, um, and extraception, exteroception which is what's on our, uh, in our external environment, like the organist. And we, they come together to provide feelings that subconscious physiological responses um, through that autonomic nervous system. And then moves on to, you know, psychological responses of stress or grief or anger and behavioral responses. And sometimes these two things can be really aligned and sometimes they can be really different. We can be psychologically very angry, but we can behave pretty neutrally. Um, but this is all the intensity of what it means to, to have that uh, kind of uh, uh, vagus nerve at work within our system. Polyvagal theory takes that spinal column, that anatomy of the wandering uh, nerve, and puts it along a ladder. And I think this is really Deb Dana who does this. Uh, she's a student of Stephen Porges. And she looks at polyvagal theory from, uh, you know, the height and the depth. So here, dorsal vagal theory really aligns with the anatomy of the gut, the digestion, the, um, the work that happens there. Uh, dorsal vagal is really this, this uh, area that we go to when it's really difficult to cope. Sometimes we might just get so overwhelmed that we find we want to just turn on a really familiar movie and just sit there or we want to wrap up in a blanket and just think. Um, my mom remembers that my grandmother would sit in a swing with her knees kind of drawn up and she would just swing back and forth. And she might've just been kind of in the end of her day, just sort of shutting down and drawing in and uh, reviewing. A little higher in polyvagal theory is this sympathetic uh, mobilization, I'm in danger, or I've got a lot to do, and I really need to strategize and organize and engage. 
And this is really heart rate and respiration. This is when Leslie's holding her breath at the office because she's getting through her tasks. Um, and at the highest level is sort of the ventral vagal where I'm just feeling pretty confident about engaging my world. I'm kind of wide open to it. And uh, that ventral vagal is where there's a lot of social engagement. I'm giving you a lot of my eye contact. I'm listening really well to you. Um, they even say in the research that when you and I are operating at the ventral vagal state, uh, our vocal tone uh, takes on a resonance that is easier for other people to listen to. Um, and that's different than when we're at the sympathetic state, kind of mobilized for uh, intensity that seems more aggressive, or in the dorsal phase when we're really trying to uh, protect ourselves a little bit more. <clears throat> So Stephen Porges talks about something called the vagal break, which is really this idea that Leslie, as she rides the roller coaster of her life, is able to put a break on a sympathetic response that's run too long or a dorsal vagal response that's come too long. You know, she's eventually able to put a break on being on the couch and she's able to get up and do the dishes or something like that that we're able to put a break on socially engaging and get back to tasks at hand or something like that. And so Stephen Porges, what I really like about his research is he's not under any illusion that you and I can avoid the dorsal, ventral, or sympathetic feelings and intensities that we have, but that we would develop abilities to co-regulate so that we can manage and that we can give that vagal break when it's important to do it so that we can shift in our lives. Life doesn't have to be perfect uh, and is not perfect, but we can equip ourselves with the ability to respond to what shuts us down or what overstimulates us. And so examples of co-regulating are really uh, on the right-hand column. Uh, eating, I'm very happy to tell you, is a co-regulating function. And, you know, sometimes when I get home from work, I've been going, 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 going. And the very next thing I'm going to go to is the bag of Cheetos. And I'm going to eat three quarters of it. And it's because I've not had a vagal break on being task-oriented. And so now I'm task-oriented with the chips. Um, the other option is that I might put a break on it. And I might say to my husband, DJ, gosh, it's been a day. Maybe we could go to a restaurant and eat. And the restaurant slows me down. They ask me to be seated. Maybe the lighting is soft and there's some ambiance for me to have a clear signal that my day is shifting. And then they bring me an appetizer. And then they wait a little bit after they've taken that appetizer away and they bring me a main course. And I'm able to slowly eat and co-regulate and actually use eating as a vagal break to shift in my day. Yoga is consistently re uh, recognized as a vagal break. Talking, you and I doing this, uh, if I was doing less talking and you were doing more, the engagement that we do is very co-regulating. And appropriate touch is co-regulating the petting of the cat or the dog um, really brings a lot of co-regulation possibility for our vagus nerve. In fact, there are people that say that all creatures and all of creation uh, really have a co-regulating effect when we give ourselves to them. And so there's really natural techniques for stimulating vagus nerve, and you're probably already on to the ones that are really meaningful to you. Laughing, deep breathing. Um, I think it's wonderful that gargling is uh, a co-regulator for the vagus nerve, but think about how important the back of the throat is uh, to, to ears and to those vagus nerves running down the sides. Cold exposure. Um, exercise, singing can be really important. And so I just want to uh, impart uh, and to offer that 
you probably are already really doing a lot of things very naturally to stimulate your vagus nerve um, and want you to be able to trust that. So uh, this, uh, before we get into a final practice, these are some of the resources that I would like to make available to you. Um, Stephen Porges's book, The Polyvagal Theory, Neurophysiological uh, Foundations of Emotion, Attachment, Communication, and Self-Regulation. I find it to be a very difficult book, but I really uh, enjoy having a primary source, and he is one. There's also a nice chapter in this book that I'm looking forward to digesting more on polyvagal theory and autism. And so uh, those attachment issues um, and social engagement issues are referenced in the book. I mentioned Deb Dana earlier in the book Anchored. Um, she's a student of Porges. She's much more accessible, as accessible in her read. And um and she's delightful. She's everywhere on the internet. You can find all sorts of stuff. On the right-hand column, they, these are live links, but um, the Polyvagal Institute has newsletters. Uh, they have blogs. Uh, they, they have very expensive classes that you can take. Uh, so that, that's a nice resource and hub for everything Stephen Porges. And of course, I really enjoy Open Horizons, uh, Whitehead. I think that the things that D Jay McDaniel does on this website are really important for that intersection of mind-body and that intersection with uh, creation and creature. And then you can do a lot of wonderful yoga online. And Yoga with Adrienne, I'm sure you've heard of that before. She's a solid... Um, non-anxious person, not trying to do anything crazy, just trying to help us with our breathing and the spaciousness in our body that can be so beneficial. Um, so I wanted to be able to share um, those resources with you just briefly. And now I uh, wanted to move into a little bit of practice that um, would maybe last about 10 minutes and leave about five minutes for a uh, discussion. Uh, does that sound all right? I'm going to briefly uh, stop my video to change my camera out so that I can be with you in a different way. And so just coming to a chair position and I've got both my feet on the ground and have my hands on my lap. And you're welcome to just watch me if that feels safer you're definitely uh, free to, to flow with me uh, through this practice if that feels pretty good to you. So on an inhale, we're gonna draw the shoulders up near our ears and roll them back down on the exhale. And we're just gonna do that one more time, inhaling and exhaling to roll the shoulders back. On the next inhale, we're gonna sweep the arms up overhead and hold those arms open in a V. Stretching the fingertips towards the sky, really lengthening from the shoulders, maybe even lengthening from the pelvis, if you can feel that. A big inhale here. Exhale to roll the shoulders back and use the next inhale to lift the gaze. Exhale, draws everything back to the midline. The hands come to prayer, about 20% pressure. And then exhaling continues to drop the chin to the chest, rolling the right ear to the right shoulder, rolling the left ear to the left shoulder. Exhaling to take it down to the chest again. And then inhale to stretch everything towards the sky one more time. I'm going to use my right hand to grab the base of my chair. Inhale for length and take a side body stretch, keeping both of my glutes grounded onto that chair. Nice stretch through one side of the body and compression through the other. Inhale to stretch it high. Anchor with the second arm, lengthen, side body, 
Both those feet are grounded to the earth. Inhale to stretch everything high. Exhale to draw it to prayer. Inhale to roll the shoulders up. Exhale to roll them down. Using an inhale, we're going to twist to the right. Doesn't have to be anything crazy or strain, straining. Exhale, center. Inhale to twist to the opposite side. Exhale, center. Inhale to stretch everything high again. And this time we're going to cactus the arms and draw the elbows alongside the ribs. The shoulder blades are drawing together like they're going to hold a pencil. Inhale to re-extend. Ground the right hand. Stretch. Side body. Inhale to stretch it high. Opposite grounding hand. Lengthening. Exhaling. Inhale. Both hands high. This time reaching forward. You can bring your forearms to your knees. And if you've got mobility and you want to drop the chest to come onto the legs, I'm almost disappearing from you, but the compression between the chest and the legs is really what we're going for. And going ahead and releasing the head, chin to chest, and then roll that all the way up one vertebra at a time, stretching those fingertips towards the sky exhaling them down through heart center. Now a little bit of this flow is really enacting that polyvagal autonomic ladder that Deb Dana drew out for us. An inhale stretches ventral vagal, the hearts open, the chests open, the face is lifted. This can feel pretty vulnerable. Exhaling to bring everything back to the midline feels a little bit more mobilized and stable, as does the twisting, which is a nice hug to the inner organs. It can be a very comforting thing to do this. Yoga will also, any yoga flow, will not only have these radically open postures or mobilized postures but it'll also have dorsal vagal postures where we're drawing down into ourselves, hugging in tight and re-emerging. Now the invitation, if you'd like to, and you've got nice mobility in your legs, you can draw the left leg, the lower leg to rest on top of the right uh, leg, just above the knee. This is a figure four and it is an open hip. So we're drawing the heart forward and we're just bending forward into that open hip. Doesn't have to be very deep. Big inhale and exhale to go ahead and drop the chin to the chest to get a back line stretch and then roll it up one vertebra at a time. Releasing that left leg to ground to the earth and draw the right leg to create a figure four on the left. Inhale to draw forward, hinge at that hip, pressing that right hip open. Some of what uh, yoga really teaches us is that the major girdles of the body in the shoulders and the hips are places where we can be open or we can be kind of locked in and closed. Exhale to drop the chin to the chest, get the back line stretch. And on the inhale, roll it up. And ground that right hand, right foot back down to the earth. Inhale to draw it up and exhale to draw it down. The next invitation is to take the left leg and just cross it over the right. Stretching the arms open, drawing the low belly in, we're gonna draw the left hand underneath the right. Now that can seem kind of weird, so you can just do a hug here if that feels better. The point is that everything is drawn into the midline. 
everything is hugged in. This is a remarkably protective posture for the heart, for the gut, and then on the exhale, we fold it forward, just however far your flesh, your bone structure lets you fold. Exhale the chin to the chest. One round of breath in that compression. And then inhale to lift. Open those arms and exhale to release. The arms slide the leg away. And we'll take the right leg and cross it over. Open the arms like an eagle. Draw the right arm underneath the left. Lifting everything to the midline and drawing it forward here. One round of breath in this compression. Inhale to lift it up. Release the arms to a wide stretch. Let them go and slide that right leg. Draw an inhale and an exhale. Really nice work. Um, thanks for joining me in that practice. Uh, one of the connections I really think is powerful between yoga and polyvagal theory is that when we flow in such a way that we're radically open or stabilized or closed, we are practicing a vagal break in the body. And that really becomes then more accessible to the mind uh, and to that relationship between mind and body. So it's really been my privilege to share just at a very top level this uh, fascinating vagus nerve, the polyvagal theory, which is just uh, packed with science and research, and then yoga, which uh, has its uh, home really in Hindu philosophy. We've not talked about that tonight, but I have um, given Sherry a link to an open access article that I wrote on, uh, it's entitled Sanctuary Yoga, and it's about, you know, how and if you should appropriate practices like this into a different religious venue. So um, there's some appropriation material in that. But really,